Ryan, Francesc and Coral Ruggi and Evaristo will be with us to meet us at the panel discussion. So you've been told where you're supposed to sit? Okay. We will have the roving mics, so and, and we will try to be strict with time. So, again, feel free to ask the panelists. So, the, uh, and also, the, hopefully, we can have some discussion. I'll be taking this chair. I haven't been told which chair was mine, but apparently, this is the only one left. So, first of all, Evaristo Coral, you have not had a chance yet to tell us about your views, your comments, and maybe you can comment on, as principles, what have you been seeing this morning, and to tell us a bit more about your previous presentations, something that struck you, or that caught your attention. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for having provided us with the opportunity so many school managers and teachers sharing and learning with Francesc, with Brian, that have so dearly contributed. A couple of things on what they touched upon and also on the contributions brought by our colleagues that are amongst the shortlisted for the awards. There are a couple of areas things that I think are fundamental. First, the need to have a systemic change. I think that we are facing a time where there are many different experiences for change and incorporation of technologies, and we need to translate these and to elevate them into a systematic way. And also, one area that you touched, that I believe it's crucial, is to provide the foundations of these on science studies. And this is why I believe your contributions were so important. Because, again, technology would only make sense, as Francesc was saying, if it's value contributing, if it's making a difference, if it's making our students learning more and learning better. And this is something that needs to be well-founded and we need to in be based on the inputs brought by the neurosciences. I think that this is what would be my take-home message. Yes, I've also learned quite a lot, considering that in the case of Mr. Pedro and Mr. Subirana, we have seen different realities, different pieces of research and academic research. But then, I'm a manager, but I'm also teaching in the classroom, working with my students, and Therefore, when you're in there, I also feel close to the people that will receive the awards because I'm sure that we're all well convinced about this. And most of us are teachers or still teaching in the classroom and also we have a passion for technologies and therefore we are convinced that and we sh should be like the apostles, preachers convincing the unconvinced and like Mr. Hoffman was saying, like mobile is everything that's the motto but life is mobile life is mobility and life is connectivity and therefore under such circumstances one way of chasing the laggards the lazy ones is motivating them is providing strategies because and i think that maybe other lessons are better than we tend to think about them of. and the token of this is that the, there are more and more engaged people with the M schools and these are positive effects and we need to be positive at them so given this framework I'm positive as well and I think that technology is a supporter is a mediator as a tool that's engaging people and since life is mobile well we have to be so as well. Um, just like um, Evaristo was saying, uh, well, these word, the lazy ones, I don't like it. I don't like it at all because I think that the ones that are dropped from the system 
uh, maybe we are accountable for this. Maybe we are responsible for this because we have not provided them with the opportunity to motivate themselves and to provide with a proper outcome. So maybe we are the lazy ones. Maybe we are the ones that are not being able to incorporate proper teaching strategies or learning strategies. But, um, <laughs> Uh, 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 indeed, I was about to say, let, let's stop using these words because maybe the lazy bones they will not be the most appropriate term. Anyway, if you have any questions now, feel free to raise your hand so that you can have your mic on. Now, Francesc, before that, you've listened to Brian, you've listened to their comments. What's your view on this research on neuroscience? Maybe because he also mentioned this about the efficiency of technologies or certain methodologies. Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate myself for because of being here, I've been able to see very different approaches, which is not that usual to see people that it's right in the front line, crediting the effort that's been done, but also people working on the edge, close to the academic environment. So I'd like to congratulate you on that. Then, as an um, immediate reaction by Suverana's presentation, I think that, indeed, the new frontier on the year, on the future years in will come from the neurosciences or the learning sciences. Much of this research has much to do with the use of technology, but also showing that we work in the educational setting under the base of some myths that are not research validated. And therefore, the ongoing presence on neuroscience research may help us in this way for transforming education. When people that are more serious than us working at UNESCO, like scientists, like doctors, the people that have brain scanners, I'm sure that when this is brought in, this will make a difference. And I'm a strong supporter for incorporating more and more into our educational discussion the neuroscience research. So I absolutely agree on that. I have one question here that I believe it's interesting. And now we've built some castles of sorts. And what would be the priorities? What would be the steps forward to make this possible. Brian? I, is it working, my microphone? Can you hear me fine? Okay. I think that there are a couple of things when I was discussing with you, Albert. The software is becoming an important thing and it just cannot be for schools to pick from one piece of software here and one piece of software there. We should go for an open, uh, free code, Catalan code, and to not just go for trial and error like picking, ch like cherry picking. And I wanted to speak to, to address these professors that had so much of an influence on me. And I think that they would also like to be back. And I remember how in the 50th anniversary of my school, I was asking Mr. Lufreu, and he was asking about me. So education is quite a very interesting thing that we must all consider, all of us. And secondly, we need to find a way for this testing, for this research to be done collectively so that we can all share. And this requires some hard work. Uh, I think that these are the two things that we should start upon. First time, on some of the ideas that we've discussed here, Dr. Pedros was talking about the significance of training, the training of the teachers. And you were saying that training 
with your peers, with your colleagues. It's so important, the ones supporting you in the classroom, the ones telling you maybe you should work around this differently, not, not just resorting to specialized courses from the outside. That's important. And also, the significance of the managers. There are many people here who are headmasters, and we have the ability that we have. And maybe we are lacking the motivation, but uh, if there is no motivation from the other people, there is no way we can manage. The thing is that we need to convince people and the, the Catalan ministry may implement rules and policies, but we are the main responsibles in order to improve our day to days. And for that, we have some good partners, some good allies. That's the students. And the M schools and these type of schemes and programs are showing you that even the late devils are hooked in, that are actively producing things that are so remarkable. So given that the educational model is a shared model with feedback, we need to place our confidence on the people who are next to us, who are in front of us, and not just complaining and asking for things. And of course, we need to ask for things, but not to have a more top-down approach on what we can do and we cannot do. I think that once on the top, we will be convinced by what we do from the bottom up. OK, no questions? You are usually so OK. So we have one question over here. Okay. You're usually the talkative community, so. Maybe a different mic, since this one's not working. Let, let, let me add one thing while we wait for the mic. I, I agree in that, furthermore, if we are looking for a systemic change, uh, we need to convince people that often are reluctant to change. I would say that rather than reluctant, they are feel unsafe towards change. And also these peer training, these mentoring, this type of training that usually takes fear away so that we eventually manage to have a systemic um, change, a change all over the place so that people is no longer fearful. And by accompanying the management team, by guiding them, we will be able to do so, to generalize change. Thank you. One more mic over here. I'm no manager, I'm just a teacher. And my manager sent me here because I'm the I'm the expert, I'm the tech expert at my school. But then I have a cry to speak out loud here. How are we to um, approach the colleagues that look down upon us? Because we are the converse here. Uh, we are the believers in here, but then there are some that look down upon us, well, like they're saying, you're always with your tablet on, you're always with your laptop on. How are we to convince them? And then a reflection on the lazy devils. Uh, I used to have a, a very lazy student in my classroom. He even recognized himself. And one day he came to me and he told me, do you know what Steve Jobs used to say about us lazy devils? He said, the most complicated tasks were allocated to the lazy devils because usually they would find the easiest way and the simplest way to sort them out. Thank you. That was a good comment. First thing, we will we will complain on your manager because he was the one that should be in here. Not that, not that you shouldn't be in here, but first he should be the, the main person. To me. Well, in, in my experience, I've been for 18 years trying to convince a group of 61 people. It's true that there are some reluctant people. But first, you need to be positive on things, otherwise it wouldn't work. Then. The rippling effect, you may start by two, four, five, and, and it will ripple on. And 
you need for people to be aware of what you're doing. Like, things you do really work. And mostly, the impact of students when convincing reluctant teachers, like students saying, well, that teacher over there is working like that and it really works. Uh, of course, it's true that maybe to some they only are looking for retirement and they'll only be convinced when they retire. But I think that this type of effect, it really worked for me. I don't know what's your experience on that regard. I'm sure that there are people that have more experience and may contribute. Yes, I agree with you, Evaristo, and this is related with what Frances was saying before. Proving that change is good because change will only be effective if it makes a difference, if it contributes with value. And it does so if you see happier students and students themselves telling teachers that they are learning better when working like that. And again, I claim, just like Francesc did, a topic that is often controversial, the need to have indicators, the need to have uh, provable outcomes and to be able to compare them. Because often when speaking about education or to approach different ways of working, it seemed as if this was just a buzzword or a fad. Like we are working or innovating as if this was a, a sport of sorts. No, we work on transforming education because we believe that this is the best way for our teenagers to work on, to respond, not just to your business as usual test, but the test that will be sh shown when working in a company and then they will need to cooperate with other people. And this is why we need to convince people. And this, it will be done through the ripple effect and through much patience. Well, changes take a lot of time. Transformational changes require a lot of time. And this is a structure that needs to be changed and we need to be patient and we need to also speed up and to act as catalyst to guarantee to make this possible just just a footnote here on and, and i think that it's good convincing manager and also looking at research uh, problem is often the manager might be changed but what i would be doing look, is like picking some managers from here some headmasters from here and they should be the ones helping you Okay, one more question over here. Thank you very much for you for all your presentations. A question for you, Francesc. Last year we were assessed by the PISA report and there were some activities in this regard and the students uh, were telling us that they were being team assessed but the, we were not doing teamwork at our school. So if we manage students to become better people in their attitude, in their entrepreneurship, in their empathy, in their resilience, how can we manage to have teachers better trained in this area, which is so key for the improvement of education? First of all, thank you for the clarification. It's true that when I was talking about the coming text, tests, sorry, I meant that the results for the tests that are to be published, in, but again, they, they were already assessed. The question you are asking is really important, and we see that there are several worlds connected to the world of technology. First, the world of digital skills. We haven't talked much about it, but you've seen that in the videos. Then the use of technology to improve performance or productivity when checking if students through technology can learn more and better. And the third layer would be transforming the educational methods. But then there is a shared aspect to this. And that is that when we speak about these things, we emphasize the things that we can measure, the things that are related to skills development that include the learning of content. But then these are not the most important ones. These are the ones that we cannot measure. And 
they have much to do, as you were saying, in forming the attitude. I, I'm not sure if that's shaping the attitude or shaping values, but we see that the most important things in life, like feeling yourself loved or, or measuring the well-being of people, should not be based on the GDP per capita, but rather on different terms. But for instance, on the degree of happiness, I think that these are the most important substrate in any educational activity. And no one has proven yet how to measure this efficiently. And if I may use a quite a non-academic expression, the only way of achieving that is for children to really suck into this, to really be fed into this. First, be fed by the family, first by the, secondly by the education, but also the, in the setting, the environment. So I'm not, I'm not saying anything new in saying that the main source of providing these values are the educators. If you have the possibility to create an educational setting where values, where the intangibles are the most important things, then there you have done much. I don't think the technology probably will support you much in that regard. Rather, that the use of the technology will amplify the either positive or negative values that you are already promoting. I don't think that technology by itself will contribute with new values. But again, this is just personal view. Let me add one thing to this. Uh, schools where we have these computers, these mobile dynamics, I think it's good f both for students and households because on technology, all of us working with technology, we, n we need to think that often they tech up based on what we are doing on schools. But also we need some time for reflection because the time for reflection on technology, be it, because, be it through meetings with the students, meetings with the parents and so on, we should be provided some time for reflection, like in two or three years' time, what has happened through technology. Bear in mind that this is a point of no return. This is just moving forward. And if you're moving backwards, uh, how can you say that you're moving backwards when you have, all, when you, we all have a smartphone in our pockets? So it's good reflecting upon this to see where did we get, how have we improved things and to see how the assets that we've been provided and with all the caveats that there are in and all the stress that might be brought to some but again the stress is there to stay for our lives so the positive and negative impact of technology is and the reflections around it is something that we need to consider well I think that technology is not the be all end all but it needs to be all over the place it needs to be strict uh, really linked to all things we do until it becomes invisible i often think the i often look at our students handling mobiles and tablets with such an ease of use that probably if you would ask them how you, they did that they wouldn't be able to tell you how. But again, technology, just like the motor for the Mobile World Congress goes, mobile is everything. It's fully incorporated in our lifestyle. So there is no learning part on it. But technology, per se, is not, the, is not at the core. It should be the invisible cross-cutting element so that because it's naturally incorporated. And the EDX edX, they are working on a cohort uh, tool and precisely I was l last night speaking through Skype with the team to see how we can approach this. We have one more question. Yes. My question is, 
There's been talk about the assessment on quantifying outcomes. Will we be assessing digital competence for students or these tests for basic skills that are being done now? Will they be done through technological elements? Yes, may I? Just briefly. I skimmed through these, but the video I was showing you on Norway, I think, bears a title like the fifth domain or something like that. And it refers to the idea that the in Norway, in the, in the Norwegian curriculum, these technologies have their a subject of their own, and therefore they are assessed. Just like any other subject, many people would be doubtful on this. Some might say that these digital skills are just important in as much as they are useful for learning other things. But we also know that many of them, these digital skills are related to our attitudes and our behavior. So we learn to live in society and more and more we live in a society where digital is also part of the social and we need to be able to apply the values and the attitudes in a way that they promote them. In the case of digital skill assessment for Catalonia, I cannot tell you what will be the future for that, but you need to know that there is a good deal of countries where the, where the university tests are done on the internet because a good deal of the tests that have to be done are measuring these digital skills and which will be precisely what they will be finding in their uh, the university level. Many universities, students attend with their own tablets or their own laptops and as such, even though there is a risk for distraction, no doubt, they also have the possibility to go beyond what's in the classroom at that point in time. So, determining, assessing their ability to use these tools for their own learning, I think, is something to be taken into consideration for the university accession test. Just one, two more questions, because we have to catch up with time. I'd like to thank Mr. Subirana for conveying the ability that they have at the MIT on helping out students with software such as Scratch that's helping us, so teachers, in doing a different type of work. I also wanted to comment on the need for software to be freely distributed to the educators because this socializes for both the students and for the society as a whole. There has been talk about this digital gap and the emerging countries, and mostly in Asian countries, they have the highest percentage of using technological tools. Maybe we have look down upon them um, and this should be eradicated well technology is all over the place and it's helping us living better and it's socializing the student and we also we talked about online schools online schools are really important for disseminated populations that might have difficult access to standard schools. So thank you again. Thank you again for those of you that work on these and do so splendidly. That, that was no question, but I think we got the message. Thank you. Good morning. I'm no headmaster myself. I'm a teacher. Uh, again, uh, headmaster, headmistress could not attend, so I had to come here. That colleague over there was asking how to make people involved. We, in our case, at our school, we applied a scheme 
so that whenever a teacher has some tech issue, like the school was paralyzed at first, but now I help them. And yeah, we are helping one another with all of us having one of such devices. One more thing is that when publishing companies decided to digitize their books, it was a clear failure to some companies. But when it was us teachers creating these materials, and we are more like accompanying them, we are providing them with tutorials, leaving our students to move at their own pace. And so you are not there to provide an answer, but rather pointing them at the answer. That's how it really works well. I'm sure that there are subjects where things will be more difficult. But these two videos we saw on the multiplication tables and on the bridge building uh, were a good reflection. And I think that we always work hard at producing materials, but then we do not do much on sharing. So I'm really happy when I see a teacher asking, well, could I use these tutorials or these? Of course. Of course, in our, in our school, there are no passwords where our, most are found in others. Well, I think we are a major corporation. Education is a corporation, just like the Volkswagen in Germany might not be hiding information away from Volkswagen, Iberia. I think that any high school in here should share information, not just with other Catalan high schools, but any high school around the world. And that there are platforms, there are working groups, but all in all, I think that we do not share enough given the individual effort that we all put in, because we're all doing our best on it. If, if I may, sorry. A any comments on this? I'm, and I'm sure because we have to bring this to a close. I think much can be done. I think that the, on the book Inventor, someone talked about this. And I think that's a, a truly important uh, focus because, like saying, all our schools will be telling to first, second graders to what uh, Toad will be, and also this related technology, edX is for free. Bring it in, share it, and we will be a leading country ten times better than the countries around us. Just one thing, we've talked about the importance of leadership, and we've seen about the number of teachers we have in here, and I think it's important to assess the change that this process for educational transformation shows to be how we become from conveyors of information to a comp uh, to counseling in learning to and this is something that we should all be proud of because it indeed is a key element in the educational transformation final remarks just one more thing I think that future school will be the one that we are building in the present. So the future will be there, but I'll, we need to work for it now. We might talk about values, we might talk about how technology may be helpful in humanizing us, and the future is what we are building now. J just a couple of final remarks based on the last comments. First, as a representative for UNESCO, let me say one thing that I'm, I guess Mr. Suvirana will agree from the MIT. We say that knowledge should not be held proprietary to anyone. And there is a UNESCO declaration in, from 2012, which is a staunch support of the open educational resources. And for that, we support 
an initiative that is really open and a sharing view of assets because this is what's in the DNA of the educational task. And for that, UNESCO will always favor it. And secondly, I would like to comment on how to bring the skepticals into the world of technology. A couple of things. One has already been mentioned. The leadership, the school's leadership is very important. And secondly, there are basically two ways, two credited ways, on um, bringing people in. First is by proposing software or applications to have these reluctant teachers convinced. And usually this goes through management and back office software so that they see that their most routine tasks more there is optimized through some software. In areas where there are some specific platforms, this can be made evident. Might not be what the teacher was asking about before, but that's a possibility. And then the second point is more difficult. Considering that all teachers are professionals, or they try their best at, the only way of convincing them is through evidence. And evidences will not just be as clear-cut or as naive by saying that you learn better with technology than without it. This is not the question. The thing is, look at the methodology you are using now. Look at this different methodology that might be supported through a more innovative use of technology. This is the outcomes you get, and this is the outcomes you could get. This is the evidence that any teacher would require and would not shy away from. Thank you very much. We need to bring this to a close. We might continue. Unfortunately, we don't have the time. Thank you to all panelists.